so it's eight o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we have Dr. Harry with us today. He's one of our faculty members here at New Moran. Um, we all know him best probably for his ultrasound expertise in helping us with a lot of complicated diagnoses. Um, also works in private practice at the Salt Lake Clinic, is that right? So we're grateful to have him here um, to talk to us today. He's going to talk to us about that dreaded 5 p.m. patient on Friday and how to handle those. So, Dr. Harry. It's called Rebus. And you ask what they're there for. Exactly. Well, Randy and I both remember well from Jules Stein days that uh, I think we sort of uh, had a tradition for five, Friday 5 o'clock with the famous Colonel Ulcer. You know, some reason of community area, it was sort of a tradition to 5 o'clock Friday, you know, you're late for your golf game, so send them to Jules Stein and they'll take care of them for you. So we saw our share of these over there. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, some patients I've seen at the kind of the late hour, add on patients and uh, the things I've learned from them and maybe pass on a few things to you folks. Uh, this is a patient, a 31 year old woman. Uh, she lived in the Amana colonies near Iowa City and she presented the emergency room with severe pain in her eye, it hurt to move her eye, uh, look over to the right, a little uh, proptosis, uh, chemosis, uh, edema, some double vision and went to the ER and their initial thought was orbital cellulitis, Let's put her in the hospital, uh, high dose uh, IV antibiotics, uh, get this uh, taken care of. But on the way there, they s had her stopped by the eye clinic. And I just started my fellowship there in ultrasound, so I saw her and uh, she'd had a CT scan. It was kind of early generation CT scans in those days, so it wasn't really that helpful. Uh, this was a scan, kind of amorphous. What's going on up there? Is that diffuse uh, orbital uh, inflammation? Is it something else? So it wasn't really obvious. So uh, they had me refer to the ultrasound and I put the probe on and I pointed towards the lateral rectus muscle and it's pretty obvious right away that the muscle was thickened. This is the lateral rectus muscle, here's the, here's the tendon insertion near the globe, here's the muscle belly and the A scan shows this great big thick muscle, very low reflective. So I really hadn't seen this before, at least this kind of presentation, so I called Dr. Osana who I was training with at the time and described the findings to him. He says, oh yeah, it's myositis, which we see all the time. And Really, this was a diagnosis I really hadn't been uh, really familiar with in my residency. That was the early days of, of scanning. Really, we didn't have the capacity to really define these uh, entities in the orbit as well. So he just started on high-dose steroids. Well, that was a challenge, trying to talk the infectious disease folks into, you know, here's a patient, presumed infection, orbital cellulitis. I'm talking high-dose prednisone. And so they finally agreed to compromise uh, antibiotics by IV, but also high dose steroids at the same time. Started at 80 milligrams uh, uh, that night. Next day, she was dramatically better. Really had shrunk down and 90% uh, improved. Pain was pretty well gone. Uh, motility was re returning. So, discharged in a couple of days and uh, sent home on uh, maintenance uh, steroids for a couple of weeks. So, I was sort of introduced to the concept of myositis and really hadn't been familiar with it, as I said before. Uh, what is myositis? Uh, basically, it's uh, inflamed muscle, and the age range is, is quite a range from three years old to up to the 80s, and uh, it's more common in females for some reason. Uh, it's usually acute, unilateral, often just one muscle, but there may be chronic recurrent cases. It can be bilateral, involve multiple muscles in these kind of recurrent cases. It's the third most common orbital disorder uh, following Gray's and lymph proliferative uh, conditions. It's actually a subcategory of orbital pseudotumor. And again, we kind of learned that with modern imaging techniques. Now we can sort of characterize, you know, is it, is it myositis, is it optic neuritis, is it scleritis, dacoritonitis? So we're able now to subcategorize these different entities that we used to lump in orbital pseudotumor. Example here of a uh, scleritis. So here's the uh, scleral layer thickened. Here's a muscle inserting with the tendon insertion. So adjacent scleritis and myositis going together. So a lot of these uh, so-called pseudotumor entities that we used to lump are now broken down into these specific entities. Um, pain is, uh, most patients have pain in the orbit and around the orbit, but about 5% don't really have much pain. So these are atypical 
and uh, you'd expect pain with all of these, but uh, there are some that don't. Uh, usually motility impairment with double vision, a really a key finding always is, does it hurt to look either to one side or the other? Now a lot of patients with eye pain say, well, it hurts, it hurts to look around. I say, well, does it hurt to look in one specific direction? That sort of helps localize if it really is a myositis kind of picture comp uh, compared to just some kind of diffuse orbital pain. Proptosis, usually not extreme, but uh, mild proptosis, eyelid edema, conjunctival hyperemia, and chemosis are, are also common. Differential diagnosis, uh, Graves' disease is certainly towards the top, and uh, um, a lot of patients, there's kind of a spectrum that I see. Uh, Graves is inflammatory by definition, and you can have acute Graves presenting with almost a myositis type picture. So you can have generally Graves kind of muscles, but you can have uh, one or two muscles that are quite uh, inflamed and low reflective, consistent with a myositis kind of picture. So there can be a lot of overlap with Graves' disease in these patients. Vasculitis, coidosis, oral cellulitis, uh, oral tumors, infectious entities such as herpes, Lyme, sister psychosis, and also association with giant cell myocarditis, lupus, and Crohn's disease. So that's kind of what you think about when you see a myositis. But most of these patients, really, in my experience, don't really have anything systemically going on. It's just isolated to the muscle. You can work them up, do all kinds of tests, but really just a good history and physical usually kind of pins down the fact that it's isolated to the, to the muscles in the orbit. As far as uh, involvement of muscles, uh, one series stated that the medial rectus is the most common, followed by superior, then lateral, superior oblique, inferior oblique, uh, inferior rectus, and inferior oblique. So that's kind of the order of muscle involvement, but it can involve any muscle, and again, several muscles sometimes, and sometimes bilaterally. So therapy, uh, the, the best treatment, of course, is high-dose prednisone with rapid taper, either IV steroids to start them off if they're really extreme, or high-dose oral steroids and usually a rather dramatic response. You know, the question always is when to taper the steroids, <coughs> when to stop them, if it flares up again, what do you do? I've had pretty good luck with endomethacin as kind of a, not as a primary therapy necessarily, but when they're starting to taper their steroids to concurrently start endomethacin towards the end of the taper of steroids, so to try to avoid a flare up. Because a lot of these patients, as dramatic as they respond to the initial therapy, and they, they get better fast, they can flare up again. That's not uncommon to have recurrent myositis. So I think in the methods and maybe have a role in that to helping uh, prevent that kind of uh, recurrence. Anti-tissue uh, ne necrosis factors are popular now for arthritis patients, infusions, and even subcutaneous injections now of these, and they've been reported to help in cases of myositis. And methotrexate, uh, I had one patient that had recurrent myositis, high dose steroids every couple of months, just kind of getting uh, cushionoid kind of uh, symptoms. So we uh, decided to try him with methotrexate and just uh, responded dramatically. He's had no re recurrences over a couple of years now. So uh, that's a good uh, kind of backup drug. Again, not primary. I think still steroids are the primary uh, treatment, but uh, this can be a good backup uh, therapy. So enlarged muscles, what do you think of? Again, Graves is number one. Uh, most common cause of unilateral proptosis and also bilateral proptosis is Graves' disease. Uh, myositis we were talking about, infectious causes, um, vascular lesions that can, especially with fistulas, CC fistulas can actually uh, increase muscle uh, size just by congestion of muscles. Metastatic tumor, sometimes you get into the muscles, lymphomas, rhabdomyosarcoma, acromegaly, amyloid, and lithium have been reported uh, to sometimes cause increased uh, muscle thickness. So these are all things to think about when you have enlarged muscles. It's kind of a montage here of uh, uh, three kinds of disorders of the muscles, at least two kinds. This is a normal muscle by A scan. So here's uh, the, a normal patient with a, uh, a scan of the muscles, the tendons up here, a little tiny blip down there. Here's the muscle starting to get thicker. Here's the maximal muscle thickness as you go back, uh, you scan the probe along the, uh, the muscle towards the apex. So this is a normal looking muscle. Normal thickness, normal internal reflectivity, sort of a high uh, irregular reflectivity. This is a Graves patient. So Graves patients, again, the tendon looks about the same. It's really not thickened in Graves disease normally. As you go further back in the muscle here, you get maximal thickness, so it's quite thick compared to that muscle. And re reflectivity is really important with these patients. Reflectivity in Graves patients tends to be heterogeneous. It's not homogeneous. Uh, it's more uh, kind of a mixed bag. You get high and low spikes based on the pathology correlation. And this is a myositis patient. 
the tendon is quite thickened compared to the normal muscle and the Graves muscle, so that's a key finding in myositis. You look for tendon thickening. As you go further back, you see the muscle thickness here is maximally thick and it's quite low reflective. Reflectivity here is really important. A scan is very helpful for that because lots of things can look big on CTs and MRIs as far as muscle thickening, but I can actually characterize the muscle with the A scan as, to our, as far as the pathology, so that's very helpful to be able to do that. This demonstrates, uh, again, the concept of the normal muscle based on uh, normal muscle uh, architecture, uh, septa, uh, muscle fibers, uh, fat, so you get some interfaces for reflection of sound, so you do get some reflectivity inside the muscle. Um, it's kind of a medium reflectivity, kind of in this range here, based on normal muscle architecture. You go into a Graves muscle, you get kind of a uh, uh, inflammatory uh, edema, along with normal muscle uh, fibers, so you get, again, an interfaces reflect sound, so you get kind of a mixed bag of interfaces. You get some high, some low, so you get more of this heterogeneous reflectivity inside the muscle, which is typical for Graves muscle uh, compared to a normal muscle. And the myositis muscle, diffuse inflammation, kind of replaces the muscle with inflammatory cells. And the more homogeneous a structure is, the lower the reflectivity on A scan. So again, vitreous is quite low because it's homogeneous. There's not much in vitreous to reflect sound back. So in the muscle with uh, a lot of inflammatory cells, you get low reflectivity based on the, uh, uh, the, the pattern, based on the inflammatory cells. So those are different architectures of muscles. So basically, um, when you see a patient, you suspect myositis. It's very easy to put the ultrasound probe on, and I do two views. I do kind of a longitudinal view with the uh, with the probe, uh, the white mark on the probe, uh, facing towards the limbus, and you get kind of this long view of the muscle. Here's the tendon here. Here's the muscle belly, quite thickened. You do a cross section of the muscle. You do a, a transverse view where you put the probe parallel to the limbus, go across the muscle here, and here's the muscle being cut across in cross section. And here's the A scan showing again thick muscle, low reflectivity. So that picture is very characteristic of myositis. So when in doubt, grab that probe and check those muscles out because it's really easy. You know, five minutes in the clinic, you know, you save a lot of workup. You know, MRI, CT scans are you know helpful, but really a quick diagnosis: five o'clock Friday afternoon patient. You got a cinch. Start the steroids. Better in a couple of days. It really is a nice uh, kind of a tight package to be able to help a patient and make the correct diagnosis. Okay, present a, another case, get, you know, illustrating something here. This gentleman presented, again, late in the day, I'm not sure if it's Friday or not, but it was, it was a late patient, <coughs> add-on patient, 47-year-old uh, gentleman with decreased vision in the right eye, noticed a few weeks ago, uh, vision was 2060, right eye, left eye was 2020, normal intraocular pressure, normal examination, except for the fundus finding. Um, and uh, he had a branch uh, vein occlusion on examination of the fundus. Okay, so I'm going to get to pick on residents. Dan, any thoughts at this point? Friday, 5 o'clock, you're sitting there, he walks in as an add-on, dropping vision, you see this picture in the fundus, what, what's your next step? Uh huh. Okay, photography's gone home, five o'clock. Okay. 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 There's my man. Said okay, you know, five, five o'clock Friday, really, this is really not really super emergent. You know, you can certainly wait till Monday, get an OCT or whatever, have you see retina. But the blood pressure cuff, okay, they dusted it off. And he denied any history of uh, medical history. He said, well, I'm healthy. I don't like to see doctors. Do I take my medications? When's the last time you saw a doctor? Well, I think about seven, eight years ago, I think. So let's, let's check your blood pressure. 250 over 160. So uh, I called the emergency room. I said, which ER do you want to go to? And you want to go to West Valley? So I, I called ahead, which, again, is a, is a trick that uh, you learned that you send them to the ER just uh, without any uh, notice ahead of time. They'll sit there for two hours to get checked in. They'll finally see the doctor, you know, this whole thing. But by calling ahead and just alerting the ER doctor to what you're expecting, say this guy's got really high blood pressure, get him right in, uh, manage him. So he was, admi he was uh, took to the ER and they started him on uh, medication. I followed up a couple of days later and he was uh, <coughs> improving, was responding. So 
blood pressure is easy to check, something easy to do at that five o'clock hour that we can all do. So branch vein occlusion, uh, good prognosis on younger patients, uh, females or funeral risk, fac risk factors, they tend to do better than the older patients, the male patients, multiple risk factors, and poor initial visual acuity. These are all things that are gonna make the prognosis worse for branch vein occlusions. About a third of patients uh, end up with vision uh, better than 2040. Two thirds uh, have vision worse, uh, macular edema, ischemia, macular hemorrhage, vitreous hemorrhage. These are all things that can make the prognosis worse for branch vein occlusions. Mild obstruction may show just scan hemorrhage, just very subtle, um, especially after a, a certain time period. But uh, it's complete obstruction, looks very impressive, extensive hemorrhage, retinal edema, caught in wool spots. This almost always occurs at AV crossings. That's the classic teaching about uh, branch vein occlusion. And the further from the optic disc, the better the prognosis. These are all things that in improve uh, the prognosis. Systemic associations, these are all things associated with it. And as Dan mentioned, blood pressure certainly got to think about. It's easy to check, so it's something we should all be doing. Atherosclerosis, diabetes, cholesterol. This group here is probably the vast majority. Most patients have vasculopathic risk factors and they usually have a history of something like this in that, in that context. Uh, there are less common things, homocystinemia, lupus, protein, uh, CNS, antiphospholipid, uh, factor five, lighting, syphilis, Waldenstrom's, polycythemia, uh, multiple myeloma, leukemia, lymphoma, uh, sarcoidosis, and TB. These are things to think about, um, but um, again, they're rare birds. Most of the group is in this group up here that have the common uh, risk factors. Uh, so, Paul, Bernstein, do you I work up for ranch vein? Do you do much when they walk in the clinic acutely? Do you bother with much work up? Um, certainly with blood pressure, but I, I don't, I generally will try to encourage two days early. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think it's necessary to make it up. Right. On the list, right, exactly. And then you talked to the, the uh, arm, uh, the hematologist, that says you may need to use the oral anesthetic, I mean, uh, oral uh, contraceptive mm -hmm. three months, three months or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. So they, they are all set up for that. Right. Is there one more than another that you're seeing that with? Is it just generally across the board? So we have to, they have to stop at whatever they're doing? Some other? Well, the the mm -hmm. At least that discussion with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one source said extensive testing is not really indicated, uh, except in unusual presentations such as bilateral or younger patients, as Paul re referred to. So anyway, generally, again, they're in that general uh, risk category and older patients. If that's the case, I don't do a lot of uh, extra workup. So think blood pressure, it's easy to do again, and you know, we have those available, most of us in the, in the clinic, easy to get one detector, so you can really, in this patient, I think was, he probably saved a life, I think with that kind of blood pressure <coughs> he had, 160 diastolic, you're talking stroke, uh, myocardial infarction in the near future, so hopefully uh, that can make a difference in his prognosis. Okay, another patient, 91 year old, uh, again, an add-on late, this, is, this actually was a Friday, like six o'clock Friday, Sudden loss of vision, left eye. He had a history of prosthesis in his right eye, trauma years ago, lost the eye. And so he suddenly loses vision. Uh, started about 4 p.m., he calls his daughter. He's home watching television, and he says, I can't see. So he got to the office by six o'clock, and he had uh, hand motions uh, inferiorly, as I like to pick up. And by history, he'd had a vision of 2050, at least in the past. So sudden loss of vision. So um, this isn't him, but this is, a similar case. So, what do we see in there? Cherry red spot. Yeah, cherry red spot. And what makes it a cherry red spot? What is causing that? Right. 
So it's a nerve fiber layer edema pretty much, and that doesn't really occur in the macula. You don't have many nerve fibers, so you're showing through exactly. And what's this phenomenon? Can you see it? Dr. Forreston shows it better. What's that called? Box carring, right. It's pretty dramatic when you see it. I, actually, this patient had that. I didn't take this picture, but this is another case showing the box carring, just kind of the blood cells just kind of lined up, marching uh, through, the, through the arterioles. Anyway, so at this point, so uh, Jim, since you're already responding, at this point, so Sikafak, Sikalair Friday, what are you going to do with this guy? 91 years old, one eye, you know, this is his only eye. He's got obviously a central and artery occlusion. What's your next step? So digital massage, uh huh. Anything else to reduce pressure that you might try? Okay. Uh, uh, right. Okay. So those are kind of classic things. Even more heroic is to do an AC tap, you know, paracentesis, try to reduce pressure by taking out an aqueous, and you get a pretty dramatic reduction of pressure that way. So those are things that certainly are in the literature. Um, so th at that point, let's say nothing's really happening, and what's your next step? What do you worry about in a 90-year-old with sudden arterial occlusion? Okay. All right. Okay. GCA workup. So what can you get right away? We have we have a lab. Yeah, you want a CBC looking for what specially with CBC? Platelet, right? And then set rate and CRP. The set rate was 70. I got within an hour, I got a, I got a set rate. Fortunately, we have a, a lab there. So all right, So at this point, seven, you know, 70 set rate, uh, this patient with the, the presentation. So high dose steroids. <coughs> yeah, that'd be an, an obvious thought. You know, it's not going to really hurt him. You know, putting, I'd obviously put him in a hospital for that with that age, but that certainly isn't going to hurt him. Just be on that for a couple of days till you kind of sort things out and consider a biopsy. But in this case, again, the trusty ultrasound, um, I put it on, and this is a drus drusen. So this is a patient with drusen. This is how they look. This is not him. This is him. This is a, a pacification back behind the uh, lamina carbosa. So it's actually not a drus. This is in the central retinal artery. So it's an embolus stuck in the central retinal artery. So I picked that up in just you know, a minute with the ultrasound. So right away, I've immediately narrowed the diagnosis down. This is not a temporal arteritis. He has a, no real history of headaches or scalp tenderness or anything. The set rate of 70 is probably a red herring with that age anyway, so it's embolic. So does that change your thinking at this point? Embolus to the artery? Yeah, still it's still a Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, again, I call the ER. I talk to the doctor directly. I'm going to try to avoid you know, waiting a long time, getting checked in and things. He says, we've got a patient with central artery occlusion. I treat him like a stroke patient, basically. Just, you know, it's sudden occlusion, one-eyed patient. So I discussed that with him. And this was his later. This is, it came a couple of days later. He was in the hospital. So this is his carotid uh, angiogram. And this is his left side. And that's a big calcific plaque sitting down there, the carotid artery reconstruction. So definitely that was the source, calcific plaque in the carotid uh, artery with emboli flipping off to the uh, ophthalmic artery, central retinal artery. And this was, I asked the radiologist, I went down and looked at it one thing, I said, can you see that embolus on the CT scan? And he looked really carefully and he could not see it. So I think it's small enough that ultrasound was able to pick it up. It was missed on the <coughs> CT, just wasn't visible, even though looking for it. So uh, ultrasound was very sensitive in this case to be able to pick that up. Okay, so Dr. Hayray at Iowa in primate studies found irreversible cell in injury after about 100 minutes after occlusion of the artery. So that's kind of been the dictum that if you can't help them within a couple of hours, you probably isn't worth it, but still other literature says it's up to 24 hours. So again, you've got one-eyed patient, that's your only chance, so I'd be you know, fairly aggressive. And I think the things you mentioned, digital massage, things like that are worth trying. They're really iffy in the literature. There's not really good evidence that they really do a lot. Uh, Carbogen, have you heard of carbogen, anybody? 5% uh, uh, 
CO2, 95% oxygen. Sometimes that is said to have helped by dilation of the, of the uh, central uh, arteries and the CNS. So what do you think, Judith? Anything that you've, central artery occlusion, is that something that's kind of a hopeless situation? Have you ever had any cases that anything did anything for? Well, there was recent Swedish um, study in the uh, 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 mm -hmm. in the country in Australia and New Zealand and the health situation. And uh, the, the problem is first the complexity is so great and then the patients right. that are in there. Right. And, and it seems that the intra-arterial, I don't even know if it's the numbers, but the intra-arterial Exactly right. And, and even in that study, and it's a very fast-growth, attentive patient care group, the conclusions were iffy. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, this guy is about one in a hundred. All right. So even medical legally, even though it probably doesn't work, and we probably know that it doesn't, I think you got to at least make the effort. I think the usual. And making the effort and at least sending with a phone call mm -hmm. to the request for right. We got bad air, though. It's probably equipment. once in 10 years, yeah. you know, something like that. That's not enough for anything, I can tell you. Should a resident, I mean, if you're concerned about the airflow there, and you hear it's been in there, you try to make sure that you should be letting the resident know about it early on. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I would say yes. If, if, you, if you don't try to give them, because the other problem is they often will come to the emergency room, and then there's not a clear diagnosis, and then there's sort of this the, the time frame of issues that you, you do have some duty to give them that early, early in the hour. Yeah. Yeah. Could you think about doing a nose to chest on them? I mean, 
given the size of the number, I would probably no. give it a range of plus or even no. But when I saw it, it seemed strong. Right. I thought I didn't do it. I did digital massage. I gave him a couple of drops of uh, Lumigan and sent him to the ER. I asked him to get Carbogen, which they could never get. I guess that's something they just yeah, don't do. Yeah, they just don't. Right. He's got 5% CO2 right. sitting around anymore. No, so. There's no good study. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the paper bag. You know, there's no good study showing that either of those are very good. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. All you get is an anecdote. Well, like, uh, uh, you know, you don't know. I mean, somebody can get <laughs> finish these products. Well, exactly. Right on their own. You know, it, it, that's the problem with the early enough. And there was that one study done. done on Carbogen and Amosaki gel showing that you also have secondary I called the ER and I pled my case and I think I convinced them enough that they did actually give TPA and they got the stroke folks there and they within two hours after he got there he got some intravenous they didn't there do intraarterial and he, he and history was he got to the ER and his <coughs> vision was completely gone he blacked out by the time he got to the ER and he's back down about 2400 the last check so I don't know if that did something or what happened but uh, at least in that case um, it might have done something so anyway Presentation about early 60s, um, patients with visualized emboli with their route disruption have a 50% uh, mortality rate over nine years compared to 20% uh, for age match population without emboli, 27%. Emboli seen in about 20% of patients with central retinal artery occlusion. So the presence of emboli uh, definitely makes a difference in mortality and ultimate prognosis for these patients. So in this case, it wasn't visible. It wasn't in the arterial tree on the ophthalmoscope, but I did see one on the, uh, on the ultrasound. Hypertension, about two-thirds of these patients, atherosclerosis and about a half, cardiac valvular disease and about a fourth. And think of that in younger patients, certainly older patients, you think of carotid, but uh, anybody <coughs> probably below 50 or 60, think of the valve and echocardiogram, probably transesophageal echocardiogram. Temporal arteritis with visual loss. Uh, most of these patients have AION, but about 40% will actually have a, uh, a central retinal artery occlusion. So something to always think about, you know, temporal arteritis, uh, et cetera, CRP, platelet count, uh, good history. Uh, so embolism associated <coughs> with poor visual acuity, higher morbidity, mortality, <coughs> cholesterol emboli, the most common, followed by calcific bacterial talc, cardiac emboli, most common cause in patients under 40, and coagulopathies from sickle cell or antiphospholipid, uh, most common under 30. So these are, again, things to think about with uh, in the presence of emboli. Other causes, hypercoagulable, collagen vascular disease, oral contraceptives, as Judith mentioned, polycythemia, facets, syphilis, migraine, low pressure, unconscious patients. One of these horror stories about having surgery for, you know, back surgery for hours on the, on the, on the, uh, the head against uh, some, some pressure, and they woke up with uh, blind in, in one eye or both. Inner tube valve, what does that mean? My first year as a resident at Jules Stein, I was called emergency uh, room, and there was a young lady, they'd been in the swimming party, she dived through a big inner tube, the valve caught her in the eye, came in with kind of light perception vision. So I called the staff, by the time we finally got to the, uh, the uh, OR, about three hours later, uh, we did a, a canthotomy, but we <coughs> never got any vision back. So I guess the current dictum is, Goofy was here, he would say, do it right there. Anybody done that, done an emergency uh, canthotomy? Yeah, okay, a lot of hands going up. Okay, right, just right there. So uh, anyway, that should have been done in this case. We probably know more now than we knew then, but at least at this point, uh, that was a dramatic case in my experience. And that's the inner tube, that's not hers, but that's an example of one with a big valve sticking out. So don't dive in inner, through inner tubes. So laboratory, what do you think about? Again, we talked about working up for uh, possible temporal arteritis. Um, ERCRP, CRP, fibrinogen, antiphospholipid, PT, PTT, uh, protein electrophoresis, uh, blood sugar, cholesterol, triglycerides, lipids, blood culture, endocarditis, septic emboli, all these things to think about in this uh, setting of uh, artery blockage. 
So treatment, we talked about a little bit, digital massage, AC TAP, Diamox, topical agent, Carbogen, PPA, and hyperbaric oxygen. That's something that's kind of now coming into fore. They do have that capacity. So whether we should have done it with us, it wasn't given to him, but that's something that we think about. And, um, some reports of possible success with that, some improvement in vision. So most patients end up with count finger to hand motion vision. Uh, if they have the sore retinal artery, they can gain vision about 10%, will gain 20, 50 or better, uh, just on that little uh, island of central vision. The vascularization of the iris within uh, about four to five weeks and 20% and the disc uh, two, 3%. So. Uh, it's not as much as the central vein occlusions where you get the neovascularization problems. So think umbilis. Certainly here's a hollow heart flax. If you see it, that's evidence uh, immediately. But in a case like this, again, the ultrasound was helpful. Just the V-scan, just put it on there. It just takes a couple of minutes and look in the area right behind the disc and see if you can see any kind of a, of a uh, high reflective uh, uh, thing like a plaque. Okay, another case, Brian, pick on you for this one. This was a patient with long-standing glaucoma. I've seen him for years, had cataract surgery in both eyes, doing well, just came in for a routine follow-up on his glaucoma, and no real symptoms. He said, my vision is doing great since the cataract surgery, I'm, I'm doing fine. Pressure was uh, 15 or so. I did a fill, just for kind of a follow-up fill, and the previous fill a year ago had been pretty well uh, like this, and this is his left eye and this is his right eye in this visit, but the previous year, his right eye had been kind of like that, a little peripheral depression. But he now he has this kind of a defect going on. Any thoughts on this patient? Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Right, certainly could have been. thoughts? So you're sitting there at five o'clock, so what are you going to do at this point with all those things you're mentioning? I did, but again, long-standing glaucoma, I didn't dilate that well, you know, just uh, older patient, uh, uh, pseudophagic, so it's kind of hard to see the periphery real well of the retina, and so did the ultrasound and shallow detachment corresponding to that area of the field defect, so always always think about that. These can really, these can really fool you, and especially with, this one's hard to see the fundus. They can be really tough, you know, it's, they're shallow and they're just really kind of subtle, so this is superior, so he's at risk for spreading and into the macula, so got him to the retina uh, specialist, but uh, always be thinking of shallow detachments in these kind of atypical cases. So detachments in general, 6% of people have asymptomatic uh, atrophic holes which do not detach. A lot of this was from the work of Norm Beyer, who was at UCLA when we were there, did a lot of this stuff, was able to watch these things and they don't progress over time. Most occur in patients age 40 to 70, uh, the lifetime risk for in the U.S. is about 1 in 300 for anybody to get a detached retina, not counting all the different risk factors. Increased risk in high myopes, more than six diopters, family history, cataract surgery with vitreous loss with detachment, rate of 10%, trauma. And 15% to tell it that any other eye developed detachments. So Randy, current cataract surgery, you know, high state-of-the-art, Baco, uh, what's your thoughts on detached retina? I know it used to be taught, it was pretty high with we used to, uh, what used to do it. Is that pretty well evened out now as far well as you know? there's been a lot of good studies uh, on that and relatively large ones. Um, I was involved in a couple. And, and we just wrote, the, I was on the executive committee writing the academy committee for practice. And so uh, it turns out that if you're over 60 years of age and you're below uh, uh, anterior uh, posterior di uh, diameter is, is less than 24 uh, millimeters long, small, it's not necessarily doing anything wrong in cataract surgery itself. Um, it 
seems like the big risk still continues to be in um, younger patients, and particularly males who are uh, mild to unstable things like that. And, and so in that group, in the Harex surgery, the, the attachment rate in some surgeries is still up there around 6, 7%. Uh, it, it's, it's relatively high. And so I have that particular group of patients that I can call down to me and say, no, I'll, I'll, I'll ship them over and say, this is what the big risk. Turns out that uh, treating everything prophylactically ahead of time doesn't necessarily mean you got you got you know those patients have to be the ones that know about it. Um, if, if you uh, break capsule, and uh, um, and then the big thing that we can't differentiate is well if you break capsule but you really thin it just to the sort of high T just to its cutter, and you really induce no fraction just to the increase your, your risk, and it would appear it's hard to find that there is a change. So maybe really change that paradigm. But by and large, um, if, if you break capsule and you have the hysterectomy, you're going to increase that risk somewhere around, you know, two to eight to nine fold. It's a 10% figure that's probably uh, not accurate. Uh, and, and I'm sure there are plenty of patients with a, a localized hole, a high speed hysterectomy or fraction, who probably haven't had it any of this detail. So it all depends upon you know, what, what we've done in that fraction. soon as you see a break, make sure that you put uh, recursive viscoelastic in the chamber, stabilize that, hold it, high speed cutter, make sure there's no strands in place, so that if you remove this, something else will happen to the other, you're leaving it to stand or grow. Um, and uh, I, I think there's a lot of things we do now that, that have made that much less of a problem. But the, the one group still left is the, is the male in particular, and particularly the high eye, they, they are really high risk. The same for YAG capsulotomies too with that group, aren't they? This so uh, again, YAG capsulotomy, uh, it, you know, where people are using relatively low power and you know they're not frequent making huge capsulotomies in the past. Um, not a lot of big studies on that, but but we did one reported about six seven years ago, and we couldn't we couldn't find a difference in the general population. Mm -hmm. So I again, I think when you're high risk, you're probably Majid, you deal with these high myopes all the time, ICLs and refractive procedures. Do you worry about RD? Do you send them all to retina doctors first to clear the retina, or how do you approach it? Probably inducing problems sometimes too with yeah, fraction. Right. The evidence is, is that you're, you're really inducing other fraction, mm -hmm. other areas, and probably are creating more problems with yeah. that. Exactly. Okay. Uh, clinical findings hypotony compared to the other eye, tobacco dust, pigment, Schaefer sign, 70%, and shallow detachment, difficult to detect, as we talked about. Mm -hmm. So, again, here's another patient. This was an airline, commercial airline pilot, and uh, in his 50s. And he had kind of a visual loss in one eye that really couldn't be figured out. He'd been to a neurologist, had a CT scan, kind of this weird shape thing in his right eye. He'd had previous trauma, 
Uh, he was pseudophagic years ago, but 2020 vision, but just these kind of these weird, vague symptoms. And again, hard to see peripherally because of the dilation problems with the uh, previous trauma and an IOL. Again, the ultrasound shows a shallow detachment, just that a really thin, just really tough, even in the best case where you can see well. But in a case like this where it's hard to see, it's, it's tough. So ultrasound can really be helpful. So treatment, 85%, uh, treated within one operation, 15% required two or more. Is that accurate, Paul, in your experience? Is that a fair yeah, figure? Right. As far as first, first attempt? Okay. Uh, failure, all the breaks not seen, new breaks, PVR, macula on, 90%, 24-year better vision. Uh, an example here of a patient with a mild vitreous hemorrhage, hard to see, but ultrasound can be helpful to actually find the retinal tear, and you can, that really can help to kind of speed things up. If you see that, then you want to move uh, more rapidly on vitrectomy and uh, trying to reduce the traction forces. So be aware of the shallows. You know, they're dangerous, so be thinking that. You know, always be aware that, you know, funny things. Patients can't really tell you, I've got attached retina. They'll say, I see a shape or something funny. You know, you really can't see a good fundus exam. Ultrasound is just so quick and easy to do, just to pick these up. So I always be thinking that. Just a final word here. Um, this is a project we did in Mongolia just this last fall. This is a gentleman that uh, he had one good eye, uh, lost the other eye from trauma years ago, and diabetic, and he had a vitreous hemorrhage about a year ago. And he'd been to different doctors in Mongolia, and there's no retina doctors in Mongolia at that time. So he was 12, he can't help you. Go to China, go to Russia, they could treat you there, but he couldn't afford to do that. You know, he's a, he's a sheep herder from the back country. So he just kind of lived with it, just kind of got by. And so our project was to actually train a retinal surgeon. We identified a young Mongolian ophthalmologist about a year and a half ago and sent him to LB Prasad in India for a 15-month fellowship. Really hands-on, <coughs> very good training, excellent training. He came back in September. And uh, I went back with uh, Jim Howard, a local retina guy here in town, and we took supplies he needed and kind of mentored him for a couple of weeks and uh, did a lot of patients. He's done over 200 patients, uh, I found out, since uh, we were there. And he has an ongoing retina practice. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, made a big impact on the country. And uh, this just shows uh, our first patient. This is the gentleman I showed the sheep herder who's undergoing his surgery at a vitreous hammer is really pretty simple with vitrectomy, a good case to start out with for this, this young uh, uh, surgeon. And so we did his case, and uh, here's the smiling uh, Dr. Munkaza that w we helped sponsor to train. So it just shows the impact we can have in third world countries. I know certainly the Moran is uh, certainly premier in doing these kinds of uh, things throughout the world, but it's just very satisfying to be able to sort of, and again, have this ongoing, even though we're not there, he's still there doing cases and we're still supporting him. So uh, that sort of thing is, uh, very gratifying, so appreciate the opportunity to, to do that. So, any questions, discussion? So kind of a potpourri, just again, think of these things, you know, Friday at five o'clock, so kinds of things to do, so anyway. Roger, thank you. Thank you.